on screen text, Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Welcome here. Uh, welcome to the Manitoba Theatre for Young People for the Canadian Museum for Human Rights third annual public meeting. Bienvenue. I would also like to welcome those who are not in the room but who are tuning in through our live streaming. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue. At I wish you welcome to all those who are uh, listening to live streaming on the internet. You can ask your question online on with Twitter or during the Facebook event. Program briefly today, but uh, well, no, the program won't exactly be brief. <laughs> I will provide you with a brief overview of the program, and then we'll move right into the uh, speaks speakers. But I would first like to thank the Manitoba Theatre for Young People for their warm hospitality on a cold Winnipeg uh, morning. On screen text, Angela Cassie, Director of Communications and External Relations. The team here has been absolutely fantastic. So can we just give them a round of applause? Thank you. So a few housekeeping items. You'll notice that the entire program is being live streamed and we also have photography. Uh, so just be aware of that. Veuillez noter que toutes les photos peuvent être diffusées, la voix ainsi que les photos. All pictures can be uh, broadcasted online or uh, can be taken as photo. You're looking for the washrooms. If you leave the auditorium, they're directly to the right hand side. Simultaneous interpretation is available in English and in French, and the headsets are available at the back of the room. And if you have not uh, received your headset yet, just please let us know. And channel one will be English, a, and channel two will be French. La réseau deux sera en français. Number two is French. Here, who will be providing our ASL interpretation. And uh, if anyone is in need of the services, we just invite you, if you are not able to uh, view him clearly from where you're located, to join us in the front. And so, uh, as I mentioned, this is being live streamed. And uh, the cameras are at the back of the room, and you'll also see some photographers moving throughout. So the format of the meeting will begin with three presentations by the chair of our board, our president and CEO, as well as our chief financial officer. We'll then be moving into a presentation about the museum's Indigenous Perspectives Gallery. And we will follow that by a panel of some team members who will talk about uh, the museum and some of their work on a day-to-day -day basis. Following that, we'll allow for approximately 20 minutes of questions and answers. And these question and answer period are really meant to be for the public. We will also be taking questions from Twitter or Facebook or email and uh, media availability will be immediately after the formal program. So without any further ado, I would like to move into the program. Please join me in welcoming the Chair of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Eric Hughes. Eric Hughes approaches the podium. Thanks, Angela. Good morning, bonjour. C'est un grand plaisir it is a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. On screen text, Eric Hughes, board chair. I want to express my gratitude for your interest in the Canadian uh, Museum for Human Rights. Uh, Human Rights Day, but it also marks the official memorial in South Africa for one of the world's greatest human rights defenders, Nelson Mandela. The quote you see here, by Mandela is very appropriate because it also speaks to the aspirations of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to inspire a generation of people to become champions for human rights. Slide reads, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that generation. At the most fund fundamental level, that is what this museum is all about, helping our children and our grandchildren to grow up to be good global citizens help who treat others with respect and dignity, and who understand the importance of human rights for all. One of the basis of the museum is to help our children and grandchildren to be good global citizens, who respect others and treat them with respect and dignity, and who understand the importance of human rights for all. The museum's Board of Trustees, thank you for joining us here 
as we celebrate a very busy year and a very significant year in this extraordinary project. With me this morning are some of the other members of our board, and I'd like them to please give a wave at the front as I introduce. Uh, Lisa Pankratz is here from Vancouver. Pauline Rafferty is here from Victoria. Uh, Dr. Willie Littlechild is from Hobima, and Dina Spiro is from Toronto. Uh, joining us live streaming also is uh, Lindy Ledahowski, and she's overseas right now. Canada's new National Museum will be the world's first and only museum solely devoted to human rights, and it will have a profound impact on the way we think about, talk about, and take action on human rights. I'm proud to be here as a parent, as a father of school-aged children. It gives me great hope for the future of our country that we're building a national institution that will so dramatically increase the learning experiences available to our children when it comes to human rights. Every year, the museum participates in We Day in Winnipeg, which is another fantastic human rights educational initiative directed at kids. In fact, the driving force behind We Day, Craig Kilbor, Kielberger, is one of the human rights defenders who will be profiled inside the museum. I want to show you a short video that the museum put together for We Day this year. To make this, staff at the museum asked children which human rights were important to them, and this was the result. It will be shown to you in both English and French. Cut to a projection of colorful animations with English text. Colorful animations with French text. Eric Hughes continues. Those are great. Thanks. So once again, I'm proud to be here as a parent. I'm also proud to be here today as an Albertan. To say that is because it doesn't matter from where you come in this country, from what province or territory, this museum belongs to all of us. To people in Manitoba, Alberta, and from each citizen from coast to coast to coast. If you follow the evolution of this project, you'll know that the Canadian Museum for Human Rights has always been envisioned as a place that, is, that would offer distinct benefits for all Canadians. We're making good on that pledge by building an inspiring destination for human rights discovery and dialogue in the centre of Canada. Through educational programs that will benefit classrooms across the country, through speaker series, academic opportunities and collaborations with other organizations and as the first museum of this scale to be built in the digital age through a rich suite of interactive exhibits and tools for learning and conversations that will be available to you no matter where you are in Canada or around the world. Above all, I'm proud to be today as a Canadian. This project in my view, represents our highest and best potential as a nation. I am proud to be here as a Canadian. These projects, in my view, represent our highest 
and best potential as a nation. Canada's commitment to human rights. It challenges us to imagine the kind of country we wish to be both today and for the future. Its exhibits and programs will inspire us and provide us with new avenues for informed, respectful dialogue. It embraces all Canadians as equal partners in this new dialogue, and it reflects the best of what Canada has to offer the world. On behalf of the board, thank you again for joining us today as we mark a great year of progress and look forward to the most exciting year of all when the museum's doors open wide to the public. It truly speaks volumes about the progress that we have made so far that we are now able to literally count down to the moment the doors will open September 20th, 2014. How fortunate for all of us that the best, as they say, is still yet to come. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Eric Hughes sits. Angela Cassie approaches the podium. Thank you, Eric. Merci, Eric. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the CEO of the museum, Mr. Stuart Murray. Stuart Murray approaches the podium. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Eric. Merci. On screen text, Stuart Murray, President and CEO. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to uh, look around the, this wonderful audience, recognize a few friends that are here. Mary Lou, thank you for, for being here. Wonderful to see you. Barb and Clarence, as always. Uh, always uh, delighted. To, uh, Claudette and your team are always here to support. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for, for coming out. Harry, uh, you know, you're just one of the greatest ever. Thanks for writing the article in the Winnipeg Sun. You're going to write another one, I know, right? It's all going to be good. Thank you. And Jim, of course, always, thank you so much for, for being here. Merci d'être présent. Je... Donc, thank you to, for being here. I'm so pleased to be here with you this morning on the International Human Rights Day. With you this morning on International Human Rights Day. And it's such an exciting time for the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Together, ensemble, we have come a long way. This new national museum, the, the promise it holds, this happens only once in a generation. There's no other museum like this in Canada. There's no other museum like this in the world. Some said it wouldn't happen or that perhaps it couldn't happen. It was just too big. The project was simply too ambitious. But today, we see it. We see Antoine Predock's design, so rich in human rights symbolism, now transforming not only the downtown skyline of Winnipeg, but surely the human rights skyline of this great nation called Canada. We can admire the sheer beauty of the place and we see that was not what was so long ago, still a dream, is a very, very real reality. The hundreds of people who worked to construct this museum have accomplished an amazing design, engineering, and construction. And we're so proud of each of their 1,500 workers from dozens of trade who poured sweat, who poured muscle, and innovation into every beam, every wall, every piece of scaffold. Think of this, this human rights puzzle. To build this museum took teams from 40 companies, from eight cities, from three countries, working closely together. We're proud of their expertise, their commitment to excellence, and their passion. Because this is much more than a building. It is an expression of the power of human rights. It is an investment, your investment into human rights education. Le musée est un... The museum is an extraordinary meeting between architectures and human rights. Every angle, every beam of sunlight, every placement of stone, concrete and glass was carefully conceived as an artistic symbol of our human rights challenges and aspirations. When we open the doors to your museum on September 20th, 2014. Now, for those of you that have a smartphone, that better go in your schedule right now, right? So when we open these doors to your museum in September 20th, 2014, visitors will be moved and inspired 
by our exhibits and our programs, and also by the physical building itself. The totality of the experience is what makes this museum great as a journey of inspiration unlike anything you will have ever experienced before. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is an exploration of the past, but it is a vision for the future. Said Votre Musée. It is your museum, and I invite you to be part of it. An amazing encounter between architecture and human rights. It's already an icon symbol that has made people sit up, take notice of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada in a new way. I'd like to give you a bit of a sense of the magnitude of this undertaking. Our exhibits include, and I want to list a few things here, over 100 hours of video, four documentary films, an immersive multimedia experience, 26 small format films, 37 large-scale linear media projections, 512 video clips, 2,543 images, two soundscapes, 18 mixed media story niches, 19 digital interactive elements, 100,000 words of original text, more than 160 objects and original works of art, and seven theaters. Now, one of these seven theaters is a unique circular basket theater that will be one of only a handful in the world using 360 degree technology. This theater will present an original surround film about indigenous people's concepts of humanity, and it will also serve as a space for storytelling, for performance, for discussion. And you're going to hear more about that later in our program this morning. Canada's new National Museum will create inspiring encounters with human rights, using a range of wow factors to connect people to information and ideas in powerful ways. The views of Indigenous peoples are extremely important to our overall visitor experience, not only in this remarkable theatre, but also in stories about Aboriginal experiences that will be woven throughout every gallery throughout the museum. Throughout the past year, as construction proceeded towards completion, we've also been out in the community all across Canada, listening, helping to create opportunities for human rights dialogue and reflection. We have hosted and participated in dozens of events. We welcomed human rights defenders from Guatemala, Armenia, and Chile. We invited one of the last comfort women, survivors from the Philippines. We've held meetings with the disability community, with teachers and with Aboriginal leaders. We've re released the results of an archaeological dig that recovered over 400,000 artifacts. We signed partnership agreements with the Manitoba Museum, Rotary International, David, thank you so much for being here, and Manitoba Education. By the way, that archaeological dig piece, we received coverage in Zimbabwe. Now, I'm not sure that many museums can do an archaeological dig and get coverage in Zimbabwe, but that was pretty spectacular. We participated in WE Day, the Human Library, the UNESCO Schools Conference, and the fourth International Conference on Human Rights Education in Taiwan just last month. And that's just to name a few. So we've been very, very busy. This coming year will be no different one of our priorities in 2014 is to keep building awareness and excitement about this amazing new museum, working with our tourism partners, taking strategic approach, approaches to marketing and communications that will put us firmly on the national radar screen. We're also putting together an exciting program of inaugural public events and activities. We'll be staffing up our, service, our visitor services so that our guests arrive at the museum and are warmly welcomed. And maybe on today it'll be electric blankets, you know, that kind of thing, whether it gets this way. I see all my board here in their jackets, you know, that sort of thing. Um, we'll also be recruiting volunteers, launching a membership program, and announcing our retail offerings. Our new restaurant, brought to us by the Inn at the Forks, will begin to test its very first meal. We've gone from the first step to the home stretch. And it's worth reminding ourselves just how we got here. 
We're at this point today because more than 7,000 individual citizens from Canada and beyond said, yes, I believe in this project and what it will mean for Canada. So they have, a made, they have made an investment in the future, they have made an investment in education, and they have made an investment in human rights education. Because they saw the potential for their family, for their kids, for the city, for Canada, and we really need that support to continue. We're here on this human rights journey because the government of Canada, the province of Manitoba, the city of Winnipeg, as well as organizations ranging from teachers to labor unions to community groups, realized that investing in a human rights museum would pay social and economic dividends for generations to come. We're also here today because this museum has an extraordinarily talented and dedicated staff. Behind every word on an exhibit text panel, every photograph in a gallery, every touchscreen, every program, every story, every video, are countless hours of research, building, consulting, designing, decision making, planning, testing. It's taken a remarkable effort by a remarkable group of women and men. I'm proud to be Canadian. Canada has made several contributions to the promotion of international human rights. However, Canada has uh, its own problem concerning human rights, and we have the obligation towards the present generations and the following generations to look at the past and to learn from our mistakes. A proud Albertan, I'm a proud Manitoban, and I can tell you that this museum will truly be a source for all Canadians. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Stuart Murray sits down until Cassie speaks. Thank you, Stuart. Um, now, I'm not supposed to be doing long introductions, but I'd like to introduce our Chief Financial Officer. And the other day, I was in the office when she got her, pa her badge uh, to move into the new office. And she has the distinct honor of having employee number one uh, next to her name. So please join me in welcoming Suzanne Robertson. Suzanne Robertson approaches the podium. On screen text, Suzanne Robertson, Chief Financial Officer. Thanks, Angela. Uh, as Stuart said, it has been a year of great progress. We are meeting our construction milestones and the museum is on sound financial footing for inauguration. Regarding our construction progress, the base building construction was substantially complete as of March 31st and the interior finishing work is near completion. Fit up of the gallery spaces is now underway and in the coming weeks the gallery spaces will be sealed to allow for the installation of the exhibits, including high-tech equipment that requires a dust-free environment. Completion of the interior spaces and the exhibit installation are expected to be substantially complete in July 2014, at which point we will be testing various aspects of the visitor experience. On September 17th of this year, we announced plans for the museum's flagship destination restaurant which will be built and operated by the Inn at the Forks, which was a successful bidder for the project. Landscaping work began last summer, including planting prairie tall grass on the three massive stone roots that make up the base of the building. The remaining landscaping will be completed in the spring and summer of 2014. The total cost of the capital project is $351 million. That cost projection was announced in 2011, and it has not changed. Careful cost management, adherence to a master project management plan, and targeted cost deferrals will allow us to complete the project within budget, for which uh, funding has been secured. On the operating side, we have a clear plan as we ramp up to inauguration. The museum's move towards operational readiness is guided by a sound, carefully monitored operational strategy. We have rigorous controls in place 
both to ensure that we adhere to our project timelines and budget targets, and also continue to maximize the value that we derive from every dollar invested in this project. These controls include a master workflow schedule and a project management plan. Museum staff will move into the office space in the new museum building this January. That's a big milestone for us. Care and control of the non-exhibit spaces will soon transfer from PCL to the CMHR. PCL will retain care and control of the exhibit spaces until the installation construction is complete. Last year, our approved appropriations for the 2012-2013 fiscal year were $21.7 million. We exercised strict fiscal discipline to remain within our operating budget and ended the year with a surplus of $909,000, which was carried forward to the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Appropriate staffing is an important part of the museum's shift to operational readiness. We were very pleased to welcome Gail Stevens, our new Chief Operating Officer, to our team. And this is a signal that we are truly moving towards operations. Future hiring will be primarily focused on revenue generating areas such as admissions, membership sales and the museum store, as well as other visitor services activities such as public and education programming. Further information on the museum's finances, including our quarterly financial statements, are always available on our website. Full audited financial statements can be found in our annual report. Uh, I have to say we are very proud that the museum is on sound financial footing for inauguration, and we really look forward to the exciting year ahead. 2014, September 20th, ooh, can't wait. Thank you very much, merci. Suzanne Robertson, Stuart Murray, and Eric Hughes exit the stage together. Shandra Yerlanson and Jordan Malaro come on stage. Projection reads, I was created and born free, rough cut. A film is played featuring people from various cultures and ages. Or talk to me. The law is the same for everybody. For everybody. I have the right to a fair and public trial. I'm innocent until proven guilty. Until proven guilty. I have the right to privacy. My government to protect my friends. My government to protect my friends. I have the right to own my own property and my own possessions. To practice my religion freely and organize peacefully. I am innocent until proven guilty. To practice my religion freely and organize peacefully. We have the right to take part in Canada's political affairs. Our government should be voted on on a regular basis and all votes should be counted equally. The society we live in should help me develop into the person I want to be. I have the right to go to school. I have the right to go to school. I have the right to expect a decent standard of living. Because. 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 There are equal. Chandra Erlinson approaches the podium. They are with me right now. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour. My name is Chandra Erlinson, and I am the museum's manager of public programming. I like to say the DJ of the building. It is an honor to speak to you all today about an innovative programming partnership that we all undertook across Canada this fall. On screen text, Chandra Yerlinson, Manager, Public Programming. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is committed to creating transformative programming that brings about a deeper understanding and commitment to human rights. It starts with a conversation. The Spirit Panel Program is an initiative that focuses on the diverse perspectives of Aboriginal youth in Canada. 
What you just saw was a rough cut of a piece of a video produced from workshops that we just finished conducting across the country. The young people, elders, visual artists in the video are expressing an interpretation of each of the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We conducted 13 workshops between September 26th and November 15th of this year in every province and territory in Canada. We took, the op we took the opportunity in our workshops to have lots of conversations about human rights, both recorded and informal. The program's goal is to create 13 artistic spirit panels for a circular theater in the museum's Indigenous Perspectives Gallery. But as you can see, it was about so much more. Slide of a circular wooden space. As Stuart mentioned, the circular theater is designed to present Aboriginal concepts of humanity's rights as inseparable from responsibilities in keeping with Indigenous peoples' worldview of all life being interconnected and interdependent. Theater exterior. In its design, while opening to the visitor's interpretation, loosely it resembles a woven basket lit from within. It also reflects the importance of the circle and the medicine wheel in many Aboriginal communities and cultures, as well as the role of women, as suggested by its womb-like embrace of creation. In keeping with an Aboriginal sharing circle concept, the theater's inner circular space evokes a sense of connectedness and equality, encouraging dialogue and the respectful exchange of ideas between people. The personal stories of elders and other members of many Aboriginal communities will become part of this visitor experience within the theater, as well as live performances, storytelling, discussion groups, and so on. The 13 panels were created in this first round of public programming will essentially form the first ring around the circular theater. They are meant to help show the diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities from the perspective of youth. We look forward to creating a sustainable program that has the potential to populate up to 80 spirit panels with a partnership. We decided to take this approach after holding a series of focus groups earlier this year in Winnipeg with Aboriginal youth, artists, elders, and leaders. After listening to their views and input, we all concluded that the best way to represent the diverse views of Indigenous peoples would be through the eyes of the youth. So we set out to hold these workshops across the country. And that's where the National Association of Friendship Centres came in. They were a natural partner for us in this program. The NFAC has 119 locations across the country, and many of these centers have a particular focus on youth programming. They are an integral part of the Aboriginal community and a strong program partner and offered ideal locations for programming that was participatory and culturally relevant. Altogether, 156 young people in each of the 13 provinces and territories worked together with an Aboriginal vis visual artist from their own community to create a collective voice and vision. The images you're seeing on the screen are from the first seven workshops, but all together we visited Selkirk, Manitoba, Bay Choco, Northwest Territories, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, High Prairie, Alberta, Charlottetown, PEI, Halifax, Nova Scotia, St. John's, Newfoundland, Toronto, Ontario, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Saguenay, Quebec, Whitehorse in Yukon, and Nanaimo in British Columbia. In the lobby when you first came in, you may have seen the model of the theater, as well as some preliminary examples of what the finished panels might look like, and some renderings of how the panels will be positioned in that theater. We also put up some of the artwork that the youth produced in a few workshops to get across their ideas about human rights from their own cultural perspectives. I encourage you to take another look on your way out again. 
Aboriginal youth have their own perspective to offer of how they see the world in the future and how they are experiencing their world today with relationship to human rights. And we at the museum are interested in understanding what Aboriginal youth would like the rest of the world to know about their rights and responsibilities. And this program, it aims to respect and honor the voice of our Aboriginal youth. Each friendship center we visited across the country brought a local elder together with youth to engage in dialogue circles, a hands-on artistic workshop, and a new media digital program, and a participatory experience on human rights. The artists guided the youth through an art program where, they, where the youth understand that the artwork they create is used to further develop a concept that will represent their collective view on human rights. The local artist is their communicator, their interpreter, and their co-creator. In addition to the visual elements created, there was a media-related program where each of the youth from every community we visited had the opportunity to voice their vision about human rights from their own individual perspective. Winnipeg-based Métis filmmaker and media artist Jordan Malero joins me here. Jordan was present at each of the 13 sites that we visited and I'll let, now let him tell you a little bit more about his role. Jordan Malero takes the podium. On screen text, Jordan Malero, filmmaker. As a, a alumnus of the Manitoba Theatre for Young People, it is truly an honor to be here. I was g given the opportunity to go on this journey for the Spirit Panel Project back in September. As Chandra had uh, just described, the, the concept was to work with Aboriginal youth in every province and territory where each of the youth had the opportunity to record his or her voice and vision about human rights. The youth were involved in all stages of her production. Anyone who is a bit ca camera shy would have the opportunity to help me b behind the scenes. But in order to prepare the students to take on the daunting task of articulating what human rights meant to them, I screened several films that would incite d dialogue uh, in our round circle discussions. One of the videos was from CBC's The Eight Eighth Fire and featured Drew Hayden's uh, uh, t Taylor's telling of our 500 year history in just a minute and a half. Now depending on this, the discussions leading up to that point, it would determine which other videos would follow. Topics ranged from the environment, e equality, racism, stereotypes, and many others. Then focusing on specific examples such as Indian re residential schools, the over 600 missing or murdered Aboriginal women, Annie Fracking, or uh, I don't know more. Our mobile recording studio consisted of several cameras, a backdrop, sound equipment, and everything that you would see in any studio. The recording style was based on MTV Speaker Corner, where the interviewees would su subjectively look right into the lens and share their stories. In addition, I took photos and documented the art workshop in each of the stops. This journey is one that I will never forget. I feel that we are able to finally validate our youth by letting them speak their truth and express themselves through art. One of the most important statements came from a girl at our first stop in Selkirk, Manitoba. She said, today was all about me, and this is the first time anyone really cared about what I was really thinking. I was shocked, and then remembered that not too long ago, I thought the same thing. I feel that all these youth understood that no matter what age, sex, creed, color, social status, gender, or religion you are, we are all equal. In total, I will be delivering 13 finished vignettes that represent all 13 stops from coast to coast to coast. I am also working on three other culmination pieces that are all nearing completion, working alongside the CMHR's design and new media team. I look forward to seeing everything in September and would like to thank the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and everyone that was involved. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Jordan shakes hands with Chandra as she returns to the podium. He sits down.
As Jordan just described, his recordings will be part of the museum's digital presentations in the gallery where the circular theater is located, as well as on our website where the youth can access all of these recordings from across Canada. This has truly been a collaborative effort from the very beginning, and I am very honored to be a part of its creation. And I want to mention that none of this would have been possible without the involvement and the support of the National Association of Friendship Centres and their incredible leadership of the NAFC's Aboriginal Youth Council members, executive and president, Kat Fiddler from Selkirk, Manitoba, who believed that the potential of this program has to bring this human rights museum and this conversation to Aboriginal youth across Canada in a respectful and meaningful manner. Thank you, merci, megwitch. Chandra Orlenson leaves the stage with Jordan Molaro. Thank you. Angela Cassie speaks from the podium. Well, thank you so much, Chandra and Jordan. And uh, um, Jordan, it's just really, uh, you're just an inspiration, and thank you for sharing. I know it must be a bit nerve-wracking, but I think uh, as an alumni of MTYP, it also gives us some sense of uh, what hopefully alumni of the museum's programs will be able to experience and speak to and continue to do. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, so we'll be moving now into our panel discussion. I'll ask our panelists to come forward. You have to try to beat Chandra and Jordan. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Good luck. Slide reads, guiding principles. I'm going to ask you all to remember to turn your mic. Clint Curl, Mirali Lamentang, Dr. Jody Geese-Brow, and Corey Timpson come on stage. Okay, so I'd just like to begin by introducing our panel here. Um, I will start with uh, Dr. Clint Curl. Uh, Clint is our head of stakeholder relations. Um, he is ha he joined the museum in 2010 as a researcher for our international galleries, and uh, he was in turn a university press professor, director of a human rights NGO, and a parish pastor. His educational background includes a PhD in political science, master's degree in law and theology, and an LLB. He currently holds adjunct positions at Carleton University, the University of Manitoba, and the University of Winnipeg's Global College. And then I will throw it over to Mimi next, if you want to just wave Mimi. She's our manager of education programming. She joined the museum last year and has 20 years of experience working in heritage interpretation and programming, museum development, and ancient First Nations cultural heritage. She is responsible for developing and delivering accessible, relevant, and engaging programming for K-12 and post-secondary audiences that will visit the museum when it opens in 2014. Mimi, or that was we call her, Mireille, brings to this her previous experience as the education program developer with the Manitoba Museum as cultural resource manager for Manitoba Natural Historic Sites with, with Parks Canada and as manager of the museum's assistance program and the Aboriginal Peoples and Cultural Programs with the Department of Canadian Heritage. Mimi holds an advanced BA in Anthropology from the University of Manitoba and from the University of Winnipeg, a Cultural Resource Management Diploma and a Professional Specialization Certification in the Cultural Sector Leadership. I would then like to introduce Jody. Uh, Jody has joined the team for the last year and she uh, has made a critical contribution building the museum's research capacity and developing content. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Toronto, possesses extensive knowledge of Canadian history and a demonstrated understanding of and an aptitude for museum practice. Prior to her time with the museum, she received a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of Winnipeg. Her research interests include material culture, museology, and human rights issues in Canada. She has spoken at numerous academic conferences and her work has been published in both scholarly and popular publications. She also has several years of teaching and research experience at the University of Toronto, University of Winnipeg, and Parks Canada. And last but not least, the museum's Corey. Do you really need an introduction? <laughs> He's become our media darling of late. <laughs> And he is our director of design, new media, and collections, and the chair of the museum's exhibition steering committee. He's been with the museum since 2009, is responsible for directing design, new media, collections-based initiatives across all aspects of the museum. His primary focus is to facilitate meaningful and engaging experiences between and among visitors, both online and on-site, through the use of digital technology and interactive design methodologies. 
Corey has a BA in Law from Carleton University and a postgraduate diploma in Interactive Multimedia from Algonquin College of Applied Arts and Technology. He's published by ACM, MIT, and many others. And he's an active collaborator in the new media and digital discourse within the cultural domain. Prior to his accepting his role with the museum, Corey spent eight years with the Canadian Information Network, where he worked with a large number of Canada's 3,000 museums on digital innovation projects. So please join me in welcoming our panel. So part of what we wanted to articulate today is our process and our framework and the pillars that we've been using to develop our visitor experience. And uh, we really wanted to provide an opportunity for the public to understand what's helping guide our decision making and bringing a lot of these ideas uh, to life. And we use through this process what we're referring to as five pillars. The pillar of inspiration and dialogue, uh, the pillar related to can Canadians' commitment, uh, inspiring and engaging exhibits and accessible exhibits. Uh, and we also want to speak about how we're really uh, working to ensure that we're a reliable learning resource. And so one of these ways is to bring ideas to life. And our content and programs strive to connect each visitor with human rights, regardless of age, ability, or background. Stories are relayed through interactive presentations, multimedia technology, and world-class design. We're working closely with master exhibit designers, Ralph Applebaum Associates, in collaboration with our own team of experts, researchers, and curators. So Corey uh, is one of our primary intermediaries with Ralph Applebaum, and I'd like you to speak to us today a little bit more about our immersive multimedia and some of the wow factors that our visitors can expect. All right. On screen text, Corey Timpson, Director, Design and New Media and Collections. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think um, there was a slide actually with some statistics on it, but um, what you heard earlier was Stuart running through uh, a bunch of stats uh, as to how many hours of video we have and how many images we have, one, over 100,000 words of original text. And that was really about um, the fabric um, of our exhibits. Um, but the exhibits will offer an experience to our visitors. And um, in order to design and develop this experience, uh, we try to make it multifaceted and multi-sensory and, and a, a good rich variety. So we have um, passive experiences where visitors will read, watch, listen, like, like a visitor would do at any museum. We have active experiences where we ask visitors to participate, to do something, um, to be play a game. We have interactive experiences where we ask visitors to contribute, to be part of the dialogue, uh, to engage with other visitors, to engage with the museum. And then we have immersive environments, uh, which are multi-sensory, where a visitor actually walks through um, some type of scenario. And, and I think we just saw a great example of one in the 360-degree uh, film as an immersive experience. So we have this variety of experiences that we try to craft and balance so that visitors will have um, basically a well-rounded journey uh, through the museum exhibits. So this is something we've paid a lot of attention to uh, over the years, and we're actually starting to realize the results of uh, right now. Um, in terms of media, we have audio, video, images, text. This is presented, um, and, and objects. Uh, this is presented digitally through print, um, through projection, uh, a variety of, of different ways. Um, in terms of objects, we have artifacts, fa facsimiles, um, and uh, scenographic elements. So again, a rich tapestry of different types of material and media. Um, again, striving to, to have a balance so that our experience is multifaceted and varied. Um, and then all of this stuff is presented through a variety of styles. So we'll have documentary, illustration, animation, photographic. So again, um, trying to add that balance and that, that richness and that diversity of experience. And then um, getting right down to it, um, one of the main preoccupations that we have when designing and fabricating um, the exhibits is to provide visitors with a museum experience that um, is engaging, is rich, is multifaceted, and is uniquely different when it's on site and then for remote audiences. So we don't want visitors to come to the exhibits and walk through a website. Um, likewise, we want visitors to have a really rich and engaging experience remotely through the web, but have those two experiences complement one another 
and offer a balance between the two and not have them be redundant in any ways. So over the past few years, we've really spent a lot of time in terms of designing this experi these experiences to have them be well-balanced, rich, engaging, and offer a variety to our visitors both on-site and remote. So um, one of the things you can see behind me is um, when thinking about um, innovation in the museum, um, it may not be um, the most glamorous thing we've done, but it's uh, certainly one of the most important things. Uh, when we think of our subject matter as being conceptual, we tell a lot of stories. We do have touch screens in our exhibits. Slide, illustration of interfaces. And how does a visitor with a, a vision impairment or mobility impairment use a touch screen? Well, not very well. So one of the things we've done is create our own product. And we've done this in uh, partnership with the Inclusive Design Research Centre at the Ontario College of Art and Design to create something called a universal keypad. So this allows a visitor with a mobility impairment or a vision impairment to uh, navigate a touch screen interface through the use of this keypad to be able to tab through menu selections, have the selections read out to them, adjust the volume um, if they're hard of hearing, and basically provide all of these facilities um, visitors who are perfectly able will also probably like to use this as well as an alternate um, to the touch screen. So it's something that we've done. It's not been done anywhere else. Um, it, it may not be as, um, first off, as exciting as like a 360 degree immersive environment. However, it's something that really demonstrates our commitment to providing our subject matter and our experiences to audiences of, of varying abilities. Um, Thinking um, specifically about some of the other experiences that we can highlight, um, we, um, like I mentioned, are trying to provide in-gallery on-site experiences that you can't really get elsewhere. Um, so one such experience is a um, social inclusion game that we've developed. And I really like highlighting this one because we have a lot of um, you know, didactic or, or um, strong content in our exhibits and, and this is one piece that's a lot more abstract and, and experiential as an installation. So what happens here is um, visitors will walk into a center uh, zone in one of our galleries. As they enter uh, the center zone there's a camera that will track their movement within the fixed defined space. It will then project uh, a light ribbon or aura around the visitor. As another visitor enters the space they get a different color projected around them. And as visitors come into close proximity with one another, the colors will start to mix until we go through this uh, several times and um, people are sharing colors with one another. And the outcome is basically that um, lessons of inclusion and visitors learning that, um, that their presence in the space has an effect on those around them who share the same space. Um, a very um, you know, youth friendly, um, if you will, um, experience. And then um, finally, you know, just a, a note about the architecture. Um, this building is uh, geometrically amazing. Um, and what that means in terms of the exhibit design is we're provided with a great number of opportunities to create unique experiences. So one of, our, um, one of the experiences that I'll highlight is an immersive multimedia experience. Um, this is um, in our introductory gallery. And when visitors walk into the space, uh, they'll be confronted by a screen, um, which we call a scrim, is 27 meters wide. It's two and a half meters high at one end and goes to over five meters high at the other end. So this is a massive um, screen that you would never find in any cinema. Um, and the material it's made out of is a scrim that means we can project um, audio uh, visual against the scrim and it functions like a cinema screen. However, with synchronized lighting program, we can then reveal objects behind the scrim as the scrim becomes transparent depending on the way it's lit. So this means we can provide an immersive experience that's sound, video, and object, 3D object based, where visitors will actually walk into the space and be a part of the show and have this experience around them. Again, it's a, a really unique experience you only find in a museum, and in this case, due to the architecture that we're working with, we have an opportunity to make it even more amazing than a, than a typical object theater would be. So architecture has played a, a really fundamental role. And I, this is where I'd give a shout out to our exhibit designers, uh, Ralph Applebaum Associates. They've looked at um, parts of the, the building that others may have considered to be a constraint and really turned it into an opportunity for us to provide a, a really rich experience for our visitors. Corey Timpson looks at his cell phone. Thanks. Angela Cassie speaks. Corey promised uh, that he wasn't texting someone. He was actually working and, and do reading. Do my Christmas shopping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Late start. 
but I think what you notice with our speakers today is different people have styles of learning and that's a big element in terms of what we're going to be developing in terms of the content. So whether you're there with a smartphone, a clipboard, a piece of paper, or you carry it all in your head and your heart, these are different mediums that we need to consider while we're building our programs. Uh, and part of our objective is to really inspire reflection and dialogue. And you know, we talk about the project is coming along once in a generation and as an idea museum, it begins with a concept, not a collection. And in pursuit of our commitment to reflection and dialogue, the museum shares information about human rights events, um, both dark and hopeful, celebrates human rights defenders and champions, and invites ongoing participation in ever-changing and ever-evolving human rights conversations. So Clint, as an idea museum, uh, can you tell us which initiatives have taken place in the past year to help inspire that reflection and dialogue? Sure, Angela, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I'd like to begin just with a, another uh, quotation from the late Nelson Mandela. On screen text, Clint Curl, head, stakeholder relations. Uh, he once said um, in his book, the, the Long Journey to Freedom, that, that to be free uh, is not merely to, to cast off your own chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. And that's real freedom. And for me, that is just the perfect summary of what human rights are all about and, and what this museum is all about. Uh, so you ask, well, how do we do that? I mean, that's a big job, creating that kind of freedom in a society that has that kind of freedom, where we're casting off chains and we're also living in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. How do you do that? And there's different things you can do, but one of the things that's foundational is, is, is to spark reflection and dialogue about human rights, just to raise awareness and get people thinking and talking about being free and about being fair. Starts there. And, and museums are one of the institutions that can do that really well. Museums are really good at hosting conversations, at sparking questions, encouraging curiosity, and creating a, a public space where, where people can talk in a place that they feel safe, that they could venture their opinions, they could, they could listen to others, they could learn from each other. Museums can do that really well. And this is central to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. You know, it's even built into the architecture. Uh, right at the, at the center of our building, they, they built an indoor garden, and it's beautiful. It's, it's got natural rock and water and, and sunlight and, and natural prairie grasses. And, and the whole point of it is to give a space for people who visit the museum to go and think and reflect and to have conversations with each other about being free and being fair. And I love it that this is right at the center of our building because it's right at the center of our vocation as an institution to spark those kind of conversations, to spark that kind of reflection. And, and, and you know, sparking reflection and dialogue uh, happens outside the walls of the museum as well. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do as a museum, even before we open, is to work with partners across Canada to hold public events where we can raise awareness of human rights issues and create a venue, a public venue, for conversation and reflection uh, about human rights. And uh, you know, we were trying to make a list of the, the, the many, many, many events that we've done just in 2013, and uh, it was too long uh, for me to read to you here, but just very briefly, here's just a, just a cross-section of them. Uh, we had uh, events this year organized with local partners uh, that looked at the genocide trials in Guatemala, gender-based violence during wartime, especially the Second World War in Asia, Canada's connection to the Armenian genocide, the struggle for disability rights, women's rights, the legacy of human rights violations under Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union, indigenous children and the Canadian child welfare system, same-sex marriage, efforts to rebuild human rights after the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile, the challenges of human rights education in Canadian classrooms, uh, we hosted a Fragile Freedoms Lecture Series with the University of Manitoba, which featured world-class human rights thinkers and was broadcast nationally on CBC Radio's Ideas Program. And finally, 
uh, we held guided tours of the museum from May to October in 2013 in an effort to connect visitors to the human rights stories that exist all around us with thousands of people participating. And that's just a cross section of some of the things we're doing, all to stimulate reflection and dialogue. And once we open in September 2014, the exhibits and the programs will continue to foster thinking and talking about this big, big idea of, of human rights and as Nelson Mandela said, how to use our freedom to respect and enhance the freedom of others. Thank you. On screen event snapshots. Thank you, Clint, for allowing us to look at a few ways of inspiring reflection and dialogue. I want to focus now a little bit in terms of the museum's uh, Canadianness and examination of Canadian pride and Canadians' commitments. Uh, we are the first national museum to have been established since 1967, and now one of only two located outside of the national capital region. On screen text, Angela Cassie, Director of Communications and External Relations. And we certainly expect that uh, the programming and the stories will be told uh, will be able to be a source of both local and Canadian pride. And with its largest gallery dedicated to Canada's own human rights journey, the museum will reflect on our commitment to freedom and democracy, but also the complex challenges we have faced and continue to face. So Jody, as the researcher, uh, you're involved uh, in the development of the content in, in many of our exhibits. Can you talk a little bit about the Canadianness of the museum as a whole and maybe focus a little bit on the Canadian Journey Gallery? Um, sure. So uh, the largest gallery of the museum is called uh, Canadian Journeys. On screen text, Dr. Jody Gleesbrow, Acting Manager, Research. Um, this gallery contains nearly 10,000 square feet of exhibit space, um, and it's dedicated to examining a whole variety of human rights issues, past and present, that have faced Canadians. Uh, the stories in the gallery are envisioned um, not as a single sort of linear narrative, but rather uh, what we refer to as a patchwork quilt of stories. Uh, so this includes people of all different backgrounds, ages, abilities, uh, races, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, stories with really um, a variety of impacts that's really meant to be um, accessible to a broad array of audiences. Uh, we use a storytelling approach in this gallery so that visitors really recognize themselves in the stories. Uh, we have a really broad variety of exhibits that we cover in both built exhibits and digital components. So some of these exhibits include uh, women's rights and women's efforts in the 20th century to promote and defend their rights. Um, we have stories on internment during World War I, uh, racial segregation and black Canadian experiences, exhibits on the Chinese head tax, uh, disability rights. And these are just uh, a small number of, of a much wider variety of exhibits. Uh, and so the, the gallery is also really envisioned as a journey. So it speaks to where um, Canada and Canadians have come from, various struggles that Canadians have confronted and overcome in the past, the lessons that we've learned, and then also speaking to uh, the ideas and the hopes that Canada and Canadians have for the future. Um, and so when we think of the journey as a whole and when we think of the museum uh, and its sort of Canadianness. Uh, this also doesn't mean uh, we're presenting an uncritical celebration of all, of all of Canadian history. It's really a measured uh, reflection on struggles as well as successes. Um, and this approach to Canada and Canadian journeys is also spread throughout the entire museum. Uh, so there is Canadian content in every single gallery in the museum. Uh, one notable gallery is called um, Actions Count. And this gallery is a really youth-oriented uh, gallery space. It includes a whole variety of stories about younger Canadians, children, youth, uh, who have really taken part in inspiring campaigns on human rights issues. Uh, so some of these stories include um, the Pink Shirts anti-bullying campaign, uh, the struggle for French language education in Manitoba, uh, a project that looks at the legacy and impact of residential schools for children, uh, and so it's, it's really a way of um, creating dialogue and engagement with, with a broad variety of audiences and ages. Uh, we also have important Canadian content in other galleries that are focused more on international human rights struggles. 
And so this is a way to really connect Canada's human rights culture to the broader international sphere, show how Canadians have participated in the global sphere. So for example, in our uh, gallery on examining the Holocaust, uh, we plan to have a film that looks at Canadians' uh, perspectives towards the Holocaust and issues of anti-Semitism in Canada at the time. Uh, we have stories on Canadian human rights defenders who have been really active in a global context and showing their many contributions. Uh, we also have crucial Canadian stories that are part of a broad uh, interactive world map of contemporary human rights stories. And again, illustrating this idea of where we've come from, the issues that we continue to face, and, and the challenges that we, that we go through in, in defining Canada's human rights culture. Um, the Canadian-ness of the museum is also really grounded in the architecture of the building itself. Uh, so from the roots of the building, which quite literally uh, roots the museum in the local landscape, uh, to the Tower of Hope and the, the glass components, which are intended to signify ice and uh, glaciers. So this speaks to Canada's image of itself you know, as a northern country. Uh, and then finally, all the great amounts of limestone from Tyndall, Manitoba, uh, which is over 450 million years old and is um, another quite literal way that the museum is firmly, firmly grounded in uh, the local and national context. Angela Cassie speaks. Thank you. So we want to stress education as one of five pillars of the history told by the museum. Attention on the other pillar that relates to education. And as a national hub for human rights learning, the museum will welcome thousands of students from all ages and levels. And as a reliable global resource on human rights, the museum's part will partner with other educators, researchers, and experts. Archives and collections, including oral histories told by those with lived experience, support human rights scholarship as primary sources. So Mireille, can you talk to us a little bit more about what your department is doing uh, in the education program to accomplish these objectives? On screen text, Mireille Lamantang, manager, so, education um, programming. I think it's quite an amazing time uh, in Canada right now for human rights education. Virtually every province and territory across the country has been integrating human rights education in its curricula from kindergarten to grade 12 and across all subject areas. So this is a pretty incredible thing. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that uh, where we might normally think of, of social studies or, or math as a basic subject in school, we're going way beyond that and human rights is now being taught in English language arts, language and languages and cultures. Uh, health and, and physical education, uh, religion, art classes, and the list goes on. Really, there's just so many opportunities. So I think that the museum is really well positioned uh, moving forward to offer age-appropriate programming for students from kindergarten all the way to university. So I think that's one, one really amazing thing uh, uh, that, that puts us in a, in a great place. Um, we've been consulting with teachers and uh, school administrators and curriculum experts across the country and, and trying to make sure that we're running a credible and, and reliable uh, uh, education program. And we've learned some real golden nuggets from them. Like, for example, they, the teachers told us that they find human rights challenging to teach at school. And um, they, they've also said that uh, only 25% of them have ever received any professional development training in teaching human rights, even though human rights is taught in all schools across Canada. So we're really looking to find ways to act as a forum for conversation for teachers, as well as a clearinghouse for education resources uh, so that we can make absolutely sure that, that uh, when teachers struggle to find time to put their lesson plans together, that they can come to one place and find everything they need to put a lesson plan together. And then in terms of, of, of for the students, well, this is probably the most exciting part. I'm, I'm very excited about the, uh, the uh, inaugural set of, of programs that we're preparing. We've got, uh, we're developing programs for kindergarten to grade four that involve things like uh, storytelling, 
dancing, we've got a human rights rap going on, we've got art making, and, and all of this will do things like convey uh, uh, messages around what it feels like to be included or excluded in society, and that every child can make a difference. For middle school, we're developing programs around human right, Canadian human rights defenders and champions. We're gonna talk about stereotyping. We're gonna talk about children's rights. We're gonna talk about, oh geez, there's, uh, there's so much. I can't, even, I can't even think right now. There's just so many uh, opportunities. Democracy and citizenship. Uh, for high school audiences, we're developing something right now on what happens when rights conflict, and it's a debate program. Uh, we're talking about uh, developing a tour around a C Canadian human rights journey through time for high school. And of course, we're developing a national student program for high school and post-secondary audiences that will involve uh, multiple learning modules uh, for students that want to come and learn in depth at the museum for anywhere from a half a day to five days in, de in depth uh, learning. So it's, it's just a, such a privileged position for, for me to be, and I feel like I'm really on the, on, in the most exciting job <laughs> in the museum. I'm sure we all feel like that. But uh, for me, this is really great. And I would say that, uh, you know, I think in terms of the museum as an environment for learning, it's just going to be incredible. This is, this is taking kids way out of their familiar environment of the classroom and of, uh, of school and of home. Uh, into this awe-inspiring, uh, uh, beautiful and original uh, place to open their ears and their eyes and their minds to uh, the world of human rights. I'm, I'm so excited that uh, we have three large classrooms that were generously sponsored by the Manitoba Teachers Society. So all Manitoba teachers contributed to this. So we're very proud of that. And uh, in there, we're going to have state-of-the-art technology such as video conferencing so that we can connect with people around the world. So, so this is really amazing. I think the Tower of Hope is going to be a huge draw for students. Um, and you know, the list goes on. So I could talk for probably an hour just on how exciting this, this program development is. And uh, uh, hopefully, we continue to be able to contribute uh, to, uh, uh, and, or sorry, rather consult with teachers and, and people that are involved in the education system so that we can make sure that we meet people's needs and expectations. Thank you. Angela Cassie speaks. Thank you so, so much, and it, it is exciting, and, and uh, for us, we can't wait to start hearing all those students coming through that group entrance and entering the museum, and I think that'll represent another exciting new milestone. And uh, as we've heard each of the panelists speak, they brought out some of the architectural elements and that connection and the personal connection that they have with those elements, because the building itself is part of the human rights experience. It's more than a vessel. It's an articulation of the museum's human rights narrative in physical form. And that's part of our fifth pillar, the amazing architecture. It incorporates, as Corey said, complex geometry and human rights symbolism in every component, from its massive roots through its mountain galleries, garden of contemplation, and glass cloud to that shining tower of hope, which will be lit this evening. In 2005, world-renowned architect Antoine Pradox design was selected from a pool of submissions from architects from 21 different countries. And in 2008, the first shovel hit the ground. And on September 20th, 2012, the final piece of glass was installed. And that's not why we picked September 20th as an opening date. It's just one of those coincidences. Hopefully, the weather will be as nice. <laughs> and today, the exterior stands complete. The permanent new fixture in both the Winnipeg skyline and the human rights landscape of our country. Inside the building, all of the major mechanical systems are operating, the lights are on, and the gallery walls and floors have been surfaced, setting the stage for the exhibit installation to commence in late 2013 and moving into January. The rise of the CMHR marks one of the most ambitious architectural undertakings in Canada possible only through the generous support of all three levels of government and a growing list of donors that has now topped 7,500 individuals. The museum truly reflects Canadians' commitment to a more just, more equal, and more humane world. 
and the completion of the base building is one of our greatest achievements in the last year. And it's certainly one that as we have the opportunity to visit and tour, as we're bringing our tourism partners across the country, um, the building speaks in itself. And I think we all have those individual moments and those places that are our wow moments. And we look forward to inviting you all through the building and hearing where you have those wow moments as well. So I just want to again thank all our panelists. They're just a small reflection of the talented team we have through the museum. Uh, we could have every one of our team come and talk about the exciting work that they're doing, the important work that they're doing. Uh, we have an incredibly talented team. Many of them are here, uh, and many without whom uh, none of us would be able to do our pieces of the pie. Um, but thank you for taking the time and preparing and joining us today. I'm going to ask them to stay up here uh, because we're going to be moving into our question and answer session. And so if you had specific questions for one of our four panelists, uh, you can direct it to one of our four panelists. But we also have uh, members of our executive and member of our board here as well uh, to answer questions. And I know some of the other members of our leadership team are here nearby if there are particular questions. So um, I think we have about 20 minutes for questions and or I'm going to look for where our microphones, we have Maureen over there uh, to the left and uh, we also have uh, someone uh, looking at uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, si vous êtes en ligne, vous pouvez poser vos questions en ligne. If you're online, you can ask your question online on Twitter, keyword uh, MCDP 2013 or Facebook event, send your question if you're online to. Or you can also post them onto the museum's Facebook page. In the event that we're not able to answer all of the questions during the session, uh, we will be posting a full uh, frequently asked questions on our website in a few days. Do we have any questions? Looking at stage from afar, slide reads, questions, Andrea points. Oh, we have a question at the top. Hi, uh, my name is Derek Walsland. I'm the artistic director here at uh, MTYP. And uh, I had a, a quick, first of all, welcome to the neighborhood. It's just amazing, as you know, for 32 years, MTYP has been championing the child and uh, has been an advocate for youth in uh, Winnipeg and Canada and beyond. And so we're just thrilled that you guys are our next door neighbor. Points. Chris, which is to audience member asking question. Um, as an institution here in Winnipeg, how does the museum foresee other institutions being able to work with you to provide programming that enhances uh, the programming that you're already doing? How can we celebrate the opening of the museum? This sort of, this sort of thing. Um, maybe what I might ask is June Creelman, our Director of Learning and Programming, to answer that question. Angelo points off stage. Hi, uh, we're still working on, on some of the uh, details, but we certainly know that when visitors come to the museum, they're not just coming to our doors, they're coming to the Forks, they're coming to Winnipeg, and they'll be taking in lots of the uh, activities all around. Sure shifts to speaker. We plan, as you know, to bring in visitors that Mireille spoke to the National Student Program, where we'll be having students come for a half day to five days. And on those visits, we certainly expect they're not gonna spend all the time in the museum. We'll be uh, cooperating with other places in, in Winnipeg in the region to have uh, you know, joint programming and partners. Uh, we also expect that every week, every evening, we'll be doing different activities. They'll be themed, and depending on what the theme is uh, around different rights and uh, different audiences, we'll be working with different partners. So we're still uh, in the development stage, but count on us working closely with you. I think we've worked with you here at MTYP a little bit this summer already. You were the starting point uh, last year for some of our outdoor tours. Yes. And we certainly look forward to working with you more as we get into the details of how uh, we're going to program the place. Great. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions on social media? Okay. Well, the microphone is there. Are there any others? Okay. All right, this question comes to us from Karen on Facebook, and she asks, can you describe the decision-making process for gallery content? Who has final approval on content decisions? Corey, would you want to take that as Jody? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna ask, sorry, I'll just introduce, I'll ask Jody Giesbrecht, who's our manager of research, to respond to that. Uh, sure, so the ways in which uh, inaugural exhibits were selected uh, is a process that's been ongoing for several years. Uh, this began with a series of cross-Canada consultations that took place um, where 
a few thousand Canadians were consulted about the kinds of stories that they wanted to see exhibited in the museum. Um, from that, uh, there's been a lot of uh, research that's gone into developing certain stories. The research has been um, subject to peer reviews, uh, consultation with a broad uh, variety of experts, scholars, community members. Um, it's really sort of a reciprocal and participatory uh, research development process that we use. Um, in, and so in terms of um, internally, uh, we have uh, an internal steering committee that makes some of the decisions that uh, fine tunes the, the exhibits and the research as it's being put into exhibits. And again, along the way, um, using peer review and consultation and community involvement too. Thank you. We had a question over here. Yeah. Audience member approaches microphone. I, so a museum has to be in, live in a dynamic environment, otherwise it becomes stale. So how does, I wrote it down, <laughs> how does the programs contained within the glass and stone of the building evolve as, glo as global things change? And then how is that interacted with, in a consultative and an inclusive way, with those affected with the changing rates here in Canada and around the world? So what I might ask, Corey, is for you to talk about it more in terms of the act, uh, interactivity and then maybe Jolie from a content perspective. So um, um, as mentioned earlier, um, I've worked with about 1,200 museums um, in the country and in the U.S. And um, in my history of 15 years working in museum projects, legacy has been the death word, um, not being able to evolve or scale or change. And so uh, coming into this project, that was where my eye was immediately. Given the nature of our subject matter, it would have to evolve, it would have to change, and how would we do that in a cost-effective way? So in terms of the design, construction, and fabrication of our exhibits, it's, it's like pieces of Lego. So the built exhibits, the hard exhibits, um, panels and, and, and cases are designed and built in such a way so that we can keep them as changeable as we need to. And in terms of the digital media, um, we've created something called an enterprise content management system. Again, a, another a new thing for this museum to have done that, that we're, you know, we'll write a white paper on it because already so many museums are interested in how we've done this. But what that allows us to do is to dynamically change content on the fly. Um, we wouldn't just change it on the fly, but it means that we can then empower the content creators, so research staff, curators, interpretive uh, planners, and writers, to be able to sit at a computer interface and change content and then publish it out to the variety of endpoints. That could be um, digitally in, in gallery, it could be web, it could be our reference center, it could be a mobile program, so that we can then uh, spend our resources on research and content creation and not have to spend our resources on recreating installations. So um, that has been like one of the primary um, concerns of the exhibit design is to, to create a sustainable model like this um, to empower the content creation. Okay, and so that was uh, Corey Timpson, Director of Design and New Media, speaking to the digital and physical structure, but uh, Jody, as Manager of Research, could you speak a little bit more to the research process that would support that? Um, sure, and I mean, this is sort of a process that, you know, working quite closely with Corey's team and then also with programming and, and um, you know, community involvement and having this uh, really be an ongoing process. So for our inauguration, we do have, you know, our set of, of exhibits that we're working on, um, but it's also really important for our in-house research team to keep working and, and, you know, responding to events as they are unfolding. So we are still, you know, working towards what do we do next, how do we stay current, and as Corey mentioned, we do have the infrastructure in place to really allow us to do that, and then in partnership you know, with communities and, and organizations that we work with, programming, educational and public programming allows us to, again, conduct that research in close collaboration with the community. Uh, so just as the inaugural exhibits were developed through this long process of peer review and partnership, that's a model that we still um, are looking forward to maintaining as we go forward. We had another question, Harry. Um, I was wondering, um, I heard that um, poverty would be treated as a human right. Um, I'm not only a disability advocate, but I'm also an anti-poverty advocate, and I heard that the museum would be treating it as a, as a human rights issue. Uh, am I 
correct in saying that? Could I ask Jody to respond to that? Okay. Um, we do have content um, that looks at not just um, you know civil and political rights, but also social and economic rights. So this includes things like uh, standards of living. Um, in the Canadian Journeys Gallery that I mentioned, we have a story on um, the wood swap protests in uh, British Columbia, raising awareness about the issue of homelessness and poverty. Uh, so it definitely is an issue that, that we're engaging with and hope to continue to build on too. Thank you, Jody, and thank you for the question. Uh, we're gonna take another question from social media. All right, this one comes to us from Neil on Twitter and it's for Corey. Uh, he asks, how will technology connect museum constituents to human rights stories in the future, especially mobile? The way, when we consider technology um, in our exhibits, in on-site or for remote audiences, we kind of look at it as a means to an end. So we look at um, how we live our mandate, how we engage audiences in reflection and dialogue, and we exploit technology to help us achieve that. So um, how, what will we do in the future? I think it's easy to see that participation is a trend, um, multitasking is a trend, and when a visitor is in gallery, they'll be able to tweet, share through social media some of the material that they come across, and we'll just extrapolate that trend over time so that we continually meet the expectations of our audiences, but we'll never look at technology as the thing. Um, technology will be what we take advantage of to help us accomplish our goals. Thank you, Corey. Um, I have a question at the back, and then we have some hands up in the top left-hand corner. Marie. Angelo points into the audience. Bonjour. Bonjour. Je suis de la péninsule Hello, I am coming from the Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick, and I would like you to explain to me how the museum could be a source of pride for me as an Acadian Canadian. Angela Cassie speaks. I could respond to this question, or June could. I will start, and maybe you will add some. I know that uh, the, the Acadian history certainly is a history that demonstrates an element of uh, deep and dark history because of the deportation. I know that we have researchers uh, here who are exploring the vitality of the history uh, within the contemporary context. So this is definitely an example of when the community uh, was able to stay proud and they were able to stay strong, they were able to keep their culture and their language, even if the majority was not accepting it. And today we are able to uh, uh, count this uh, uh, very vibrant Acadian community as a part of Canadian culture. We examine the culture, the language, the music, and the way it is expressed by Acadians. But maybe I can uh, ask June to add a few words. Uh, oh, could we have the microphone, please? Intervention inaudible. The interpreter cannot hear. The microphone is passed. June Creelman speaks. I just wanted to add that uh, really we are uh, putting the focus on the history of Acadians. We are presenting the history. We have a, a presentation on uh, the Gallery of Canadian History and we talk about the great move. We can still learn from uh, those uh, historical events. We also have uh, the story of Acadian in the uh, Prince Edward Island and how they fought uh, to have French in the schools. So really we can learn from history, but we can also celebrate the survival of uh, Acadians. I think there's always the two aspects. We have to learn from the past and we have to celebrate the present as well as hope for a better future. Thank you very much. My name is Harry Kelly. Uh, I'm quite impressed with the, the slide that shows the building with a light on. Could you put it back up, please? Some panel members turn their heads to the screen. Camera switches to audience member asking question. 
<laughs> you can't do that. See, you can't go backwards. You only want to go forward. Yes. <laughs> A compliments to all that are here. Uh, I see the light as being a symbol, a beacon, if you will. But the five pillars that you've set, mm -hmm. I, I get the impression that if it doesn't have a broad Canadian context, maybe it won't fit in your early programming. And yet, the, the whole program to get here, which is many years in the making, is an inspiration in itself to many people in other countries. I have a friend here from Congo who's part of a family who have been three generations in refugee status. So I think we need to appeal to, the, to that message somehow. And perhaps a subset of your Canadian uh, uh, template could be an impact on affairs internationally and vice versa. Is that within your programming? Yes. Um, Jody, could you speak to that in terms of the international context? Um, yeah, absolutely. We do have a, a really significant amount of international content. Um, I kind of focus today on the Canadian aspect. I already knew that. I just wanted it in the public record. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Could you hear from my... The audience member had passed the microphone to a woman beside him. Um, for me, I wanted to say thank you. I want to say thank you, Canada, first of all, for its international policies. What I was really struck by is the two intervention uh, regarding uh, Nelson Mandela in this room for thousands of uh, people who lived through the insecurity and the lack of peace, peace that they found in Canada. Well, Nelson Mandela was the hope for many generations. And it is because of this hope that we can nowadays integrate ourselves in the Canadian society. So it wasn't really a question that I have. All I wanted to do was say, thank you, Canada. And we really hope to continue maintaining the hope that Nelson Mandela gave us. We want to bring it. We want to bring it here. Bring it to this building. So thank you very much again. Il y a une autre question qui vient des médias sociaux. Cette question nous vient de Diane sur Twitter. Elle nous demande quels sont les plans pour euh, le, le, le jour d'ouverture. Bon, alors ça c'est euh, c'est ma question, donc je vais y répondre. Eh bien, nous allons ouvrir le musée, c'est tout ce que je peux dire. Donc, nous sommes en train de mettre au point nos plans d'ouverture. Nous allons avoir beaucoup d'annonces très excitantes au cours des mois prochains, nous reconnaissant que, étant le premier musée euh, national à l'extérieur de la région de la capitale dans toute une génération, eh bien, ça va être une célébration nationale pour tout le monde. Nous voulons bien sûr reconnaître et remercier les Winnipegois, mais nous voulons aussi reconnaître que nous sommes un musée national avec une importance internationale. Il va y avoir beaucoup d'activités qui vont être importantes, qui vont être pleines de contenus très importants. Mais nous allons aussi nous assurer que nous aurons des événements de célébration qui seront incorporés dans la planification. De nombreuses annonces vont suivre. Vous pouvez nous suivre en ligne sur notre blog et aussi sur Facebook. Nous allons partager sur tous ces médias sociaux nos plans pour le jour d'ouverture. Merci beaucoup pour la question. Comme Murray l'a dit, n'oubliez pas de marquer le 20 septembre dans vos calendriers. Il y a une autre question là-bas. Et je pense que ça sera d'ailleurs la dernière question. Oui, c'est une bonne question. Je me pose des questions sur le rôle des bénévoles que vous aurez peut-être dans le musée. À l'heure actuelle, je fais partie des bénévoles qui sont les amis du musée et en tant qu'ancien éducateur à la retraite, j'ai certainement un intérêt dans la composante éducation. Where do you see, or is there a role, and how would I access that, or how would the public access that information? Yeah, that's an exciting question, and we're going to ask Catherine Schinkel, our Director of Human Resources, to talk about our volunteer strategy. 
Thank you for asking that question. It's a great chance for us to speak about our volunteer strategy. We're anticipating engaging about 250 volunteers, in fact. And in early 2014, we're going to be launching a volunteer um, a attraction campaign. So we hope to do some advertising on social media and, and radio and print and otherwise. So hopefully you'll hear all about it very soon. Um, the opportunities, we've identified approximately 10 specific volunteer engagement opportunities. And, and they vary from opportunities to work within the galleries, on the gallery floor, engaging with our visitors and guests to working with youth, to working behind the scenes. So we will be um, providing information about those specific opportunities online. And our goal is to connect volunteers to opportunities that are of interest to them. So there's some mutual benefit there. You can volunteer in, in roles that are exciting and interesting to you, or there's an opportunity to use your skills and strengths uh, to the mutual benefit of, of the volunteer and the museum. So please watch for that in the very near future, and we absolutely welcome your, your application to become a volunteer at the CMHR in 2014. Hello. Just to clarify, Catherine, you meant 10 areas of volunteer recruitment, not 10 positions, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. OK, thank you for that. Uh, so just for the members of the media who may still be here, we'll be uh, following up with a question period uh, up here on the stage uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, but I would just like to thank you all for taking the time to join us, whether here in person or online. Uh, merci de nous accorder uh, votre temps et travail. Thank you for giving us your time and for listening. Today is the exciting visitor experience that we're developing and how this will be a really a location that regardless of age or ability, uh, you're welcome to the museum when we open our doors in 2014. So we've accomplished a lot in the last year. We have a lot still to accomplish in the year going forward, but it's done in great part because of the support of our partners and, and our friends. So thank you very much for taking the time today and have a wonderful day. People get up and begin to disperse. On screen text, Canadian Museum for Human Rights.